Um, welcome to the sessions. Um, we have this um, session on high bleeding risk patients and from a clinical evidence to routine practice. And this is sponsored by uh, BioSensors. Um, without further ado, we're going to introduce my co-chair, um, Dr. Philip Urban, and then also I have uh, Dr. Eric Eckhart from Switzerland joining me, um, Dr. J.Y. Hoon from Korea, uh, Ashri Ranga from Malaysia, I have Donny Furman from Indonesia, Andrew Ong from Australia, and of course Christoph Neighbor uh, also from Germany. So we have a lovely case uh, coming from the uh, National Heart Center, so maybe if I'm not sure whether they're actually ready yet, and so maybe we can actually have a look at the live case um, in National Heart Center on a high beating risk patient uh, going through uh, PCI. Now there's quite a lot of uh, things that are going through. Okay, let's see if the live demonstrations, uh, live center is ready. Hello? And I also want to remind the uh, uh, audience to download the apps on the React Now so that there will be questions that you can raise on the, the apps. Hello? Hello? Is that Sutek? Yeah, Sutek. Sutek? Yeah. And Chitang, can you hear us? I can hear you, Paul. Can you hear us? We can hear it nice and clearly. Okay, so we, we, have, a, we have a very good audience attendance here. We're looking forward to your case. Okay, together with me, I have Philip, Christoph, uh, Astri, uh, Eric here, you know, Andrew is also here, and Donnie Furman, and Professor Hoon from uh, Korea. So uh, we're waiting to see what you have for us. Hi, Paul Phillips, uh, all the friends and colleagues, uh, welcome to this case. The, yeah, uh, we have a very interesting case. Uh, perhaps I'll just, can, can you still hear me? There's a little bit of issue sorry, sorry, with can the... You? We can hear you very clearly. I came can, for uh, so yeah. now it went Okay. Yeah, we have a 63-year-old no. gentleman um, um, that, uh, that uh, from 1989 has been on hemodialysis for IgA nephropathy with end-stage renal failure, and 10 years later had the first open-heart surgery for stripping of the pericardium for constrictive pericarditis. And he also had liver cirrhosis, child B, uh, no, with portal really. hypertension and... Uh, esophageal varices, and so far no documented so reading my, yeah. from the esophageal varices, but it's definitely present. And uh, since uh, March okay, okay. 2016, oh, right. okay. uh, he presented with the uh, intradialysis angina, and uh, the angiogram done in another institution at that time showed a long LAD lesion with uh, uh, involvement of the austere LAD. And uh, the heart team discussion at that time considered him to be of high surgical risk and then was initially planned for PCI. About a month after the discovery of the IHD, he complained of the progressive uh, bilateral upper and lower limb numbness and weakness and was subsequently found to have a cervical myelopathy. And uh, you can see from this x-ray that there is an enterolysthesis of the C4, C5, and there's also an ankylosis of the C5 and C6. And the next MRI of the cervical spine clearly show a significant narrowing of the spinal canal at C4-5 level with cord compression. So, so this uh, discovery of this cervical myelopathy together with the IHD yeah, dictate a lot of the things that uh, has been done for him uh, in the next, uh, last uh, one and a half years. So the initial plan was to go for early PCI, and after that, completely stop the DAPT and, uh, and uh, go for the uh, cervical orb. So he was started on the DAPT to test the tolerability, but uh, about a month later, there was a bleeding from a sponta spontaneous hematoma of the left thigh. So the, the PCI was delayed, the cervical orb was also delayed, and eventually the PCI was performed in August 2016 with two bare metastents to the LAD, uh, the size of 3O and 3.5. Do note that uh, in this view, that the ostea of the LAD was actually not covered. The, yeah, and um, then after the PCI to the LAD, yeah, the, for several reasons, uh, yeah, 
and uh, a change in the condition, the cervical op was either postponed or rescheduled or delayed. And at end of 2016, he had a bleeding GIT from the gastric ulcer. And then uh, May 2017, as well as uh, September 2017, had uh, two um, non STEMI. And during this period, in the period of one year, the serial MRI showed a deterioration in the uh, cervical myelopathy, where there was progressive uh, um, uh, degeneration of the spine, uh, the, the, uh, the spinal cord. Yeah. So uh, these were the um, angiogram performed in May last year, as well as a few days ago. Yeah. You can clearly see that there is a, a narrowing at the ostium of the LAD. This has progressed compared to the uh, initially borderline narrowing at the time of the initial PCI. And this was the cause of his recurrent non stemming Okay, so, um, and this is a dominant left circulation. Yeah, the next slide, yeah. And uh, so eventually, about a month ago, he had the cervical decompression and fusion done. And the EF in the meantime has dropped from normal to 42, and then uh, with uh, post-op pneumonia and some complication, yeah, they dropped to 33. But the ECG still showed the uh, relatively preserved R wave in the precordial leads. And uh, this is an X-ray after the the op. And uh, the lab. Do know the HB is 8.8. .8. The platelets has always been between 100 to 120,000, and the LDL is well controlled. And the list of the medication, yeah, at the moment on DAPT, isomiprazole, etovastatin, bisoprolol, and gaba gabapantin for the nerve. Yeah, and uh, the precise depth score was 71. Yeah. <laughs> And Euro score 2.3, SDS score, yeah. So from the history, clearly uh, we got the sense that this is a truly high bleeding risk. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. So, um, so this is uh, the, the case as uh, summarized by Sutek. So what, what we want to set out to uh, achieve today, so we're going to uh, understand and discuss who these patients are who we believe have this high bleeding risk. And in particular for this case, we're going to look at how we can optimize osteal LAD and left main stenting in a patient with um, renal failure who probably has uh, very calcified vessels. So this is um, our strategy, and I'm sure you'll have a discussion later as well. But overall, what we have um, planned to do is that we are going to go with a provisional stenting strategy. We're probably going to try and place our stent from the left main into the LAD. We're going to use IVUS to guide us so that we can size adequately, we can um, judge the degree of calcification. In terms of uh, trying to make it as safe as possible, we're going to wire both the high diagonal branch as well as the silk. And then because of its high bleeding risk, when we choose the stent, ideally we want to have a stent that we can trust um, so that we can shorten the DAPT duration for as long uh, uh, for us to, to make it as short as possible, essentially. So just to summarize, this is an extremely high-risk um, patient. His uh, bleeding risk is, uh, as you can see from the precise depth score, very, very high. I think what isn't very well conveyed from all these uh, angiographic pictures and his, uh, and his history is that he is, he is actually very frail. He weighs about 48 kilograms. He's post-op, so he hasn't actually moved. Um, he hasn't walked for about a month and a half. He's still in a high collar. He's got an NG tube inside at the moment. So he's, he's very high risk. And um, you know we want to do this as uh, quickly and as safely as we can, um, but also have a good discussion and, uh, and try and learn as much as we can from this case. This is today. Yeah, OK, yeah. so um, we'll show you some of the um, images that we've taken before, the, uh, before we started an inter uh, intervention. So we have a uh, six French system. We've uh, punctured the right femoral artery. Um, it's our common practice in our lab to go femoral when someone uh, is on dialysis. He's got fistulae in both his arms anyway. So this is a six French XB3. I think you can appreciate from the, um, 
the uh, images today that uh, his previously stented uh, LED actually is pretty good, but he has that severe osteal LED um, st stenosis. And it's actually quite hard to um, take the uh, osteal LED and the diagonal apart. So um, that, that's one of the tricky points of this. And I think the other thing you can see is that the left main is very big as compared to the um, LED. If you remember, the uh, proximal LED was stented with a 3.5 millimeter diameter stent. The, osteal, the left main certainly looks bigger than a 3.5 stent. Okay. So do you want to? Hmm? Yes. Hmm? So Tech Chi Tang, this is, this is a really you know, tough case, and uh, we obviously really impressed that you, you managed to bring this really high risk and yeah, in extremely real high bleeding risk case to our audience. <laughs> um, maybe, you know, Philip is next to me. Philip is the PI for Leaders Free, and I, I'm just wondering whether you have any comment. Um, do, do we see these patients in the trial? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I completely agree, and congratulations for a beautiful presentation. I mean, these patients are teaching us cardiologists that we have to become general practitioners a little bit again because you have to integrate all this incredible information. And this patient clearly is off the usual charts with a precise adapt, you said, above 70. I mean, there can't be that many of those patients. So clearly, he is an extremely high bleeding risk uh, patient. And each and every possible maneuver that we can use to m decrease the bleeding problems of this man will be indispensable. Um, so we're very much looking forward to what you're going to do. And obviously, as we briefly discussed yesterday the, and was alluded to for the previous patient, also a left main, in these patients, whenever possible, we have to try and keep the procedure simple, even if it costs a suboptimal side branch result, for instance. So it'll be extremely interesting to see how you deal with this man. Thank you very much for presenting this. Sure, yeah. Okay, so... Um, we uh, started about uh, 20, 20, 25 minutes ago. Um, so the objective was to um, wire all the vessels. So the silk and the um, diagonal vessel were uh, actually quite easily wired. We had a bit of a challenge with the LED. I think that was mainly can you show the yeah that was mainly because of the angulation and uh, the uh, very severe stenosis. But uh, in the end, we've got the uh, the wire down. So we've gone ahead and we've uh, IVUSed the LED and the silk. So let's show the IVUS now. Yeah, we first showed the IVUS uh, uh, pullback from the LED. Remember that there were two very long bare metal stands in the LED. And that was that were previously implanted uh, yeah, with the IVUS guidance. And so we came in from the distal part of the mid LED. The stand was actually quite well expanded. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, this is already a year in the band metal stand is all fully covered. And not much of the uh, proliferative tissue inside the stand itself. Did the patient yeah. tolerate the IVUS quite nicely? Yeah, um, he has a little bit of a discomfort uh, uh, after uh, uh, with the long IVUS run. So the, yeah, this one is just to show that there is actually, yeah, it, it, the bare metal stand actually is not that bad. I think a, a newer generation of uh, 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 interventional cardiologists may no longer be familiar with the bare metal stand. And uh, in many quarters, uh, there has been uh, uh, discussion to discontinue the bare metal stand completely. but. Uh, but uh, here we have a case where there is a good clinical indication to initially put in a bare metal stand and hope for complete healing and take off the DAPT and then go for some surgery that uh, required uh, a, a, a complete uh, discontinuation of the antiplatelets, like the spine or brain surgery. You saw that uh, on angiographically at the mid LED, there was an area with uh, with a um, borderline angiographic stenosis uh, on IVUS, we subsequently measured that uh, the, the tissue uh, burden was approximately 57%, and then the, the minimal area lumen was 4.9 millimeters squared. So it was still quite, uh, 
quite adequate. Uh, so we will leave that one with medical therapy. Of particular interest is what happened at the Austria model LED. We should be coming to the Austria LED soon. Sorry for this very long run because this one is the the uh, two band metal stand just to appreciate that uh, uh, there's not much of the tissue inside the previously implanted band. Here we ca we should be coming. Yeah, we see the wire at two o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, here there is actually about uh, 120 degrees uh, of the uh, superficial calcification. And. Uh, so a very short segment, and this yeah. is the left main, and the left main is actually quite big. Uh, it's about five to six millimeter, and it's actually funner in a little bit. So looking so at the, the size discrepancy between the LAD and the left main, um, Sutik and Chitang, what, what's your strategy here? You were originally planning to extend across from left main to LAD. Would, would that change your, your, your practice, your, your strategy now? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. So you're yeah, absolutely right. There, there is a bit of a size discrepancy. I think we will uh, still stick to our strategy. Um, pro uh, what we have uh, kind of discussed based on the IVIS is we will still go ahead and we'll try and put a foro stent first. The foro stent we will aim to overlap the previously stented segment. We'll do the overlap um, as minimally as possible, um, but I think we need to overlap. And then for the left main segment, we'll try and do a, uh, essentially a pot. We'll get a nice big balloon, maybe a 5 or a 5-5, and then um, see you know, how that uh, looks like on the IVERS after we've done that. But a really short balloon, because we don't want to go into the um, LED too much. Th there's not a lot of left main to play around with, as, as you can tell, but I think there's probably enough to um, maybe use an 8 balloon or a 10 balloon. Um, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I, I think of particular interest in this case is also the IVERS of the osteum of the circumflex artery. We we'll just very quickly show you. Yeah, the osteum of the, yeah, this is osteum of the cirque. Mm -hmm. There's not much of a disease yeah, right. there. Very yeah. So will you still attempt to just uh, try to stand at the right at the osteum of the LED or we do a crossover? Can we open up to, to our panelists? I'll, I'll let you focus on what you're doing, Chitang, but can we maybe okay. ask uh, the panelists and whether yep. they would, maybe, maybe Tony, what, what do you think? Yeah, it's just uh, very, very high. I've never seen this kind of patient before, I, I must admit. So the patient with a history of recurrent acute coronary syndrome and also uh, an still LAD, maybe some protrusion to the left main and also some CKD. So the, the thing is me is not, Technically, point, but uh, how to manage uh, the patient after the procedure? Because if you yeah, put a stand, let's say from the left main to the LAD, whatever technique you you, you want, uh, is still considered as uh, ischemic uh, risk. If we, you know, uh, put a, a DAPT in a short short period, okay. yeah. so uh, okay. it's not easy for me to to to, yeah. uh, you know, to, to, to manage yeah. this kind of patient. But for me, maybe I will focus just focus the standard of the osteal LED, not to the left mm -hmm. main, because uh, it's a real consequence to do uh, further the APT management. That, that is my, my opinion. Yeah, 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 Be yeah. Before we go back to the lamp, any, uh, anybody else on the panel would go for LED and not touch the left main? Sure, yeah. No, you would also no try yeah, and... No touch don't uh, the okay. left main. So we have two, and how many of us would do what okay. our colleagues are Cover planning to do, yep. cover mm -hmm. the left main? One, two, three. No, I, I'm going to stick nope. with LED alone. <laughs> well, okay, so we've got a we've got a small majority in favour of your strategy. Uh, let's no. see how it goes, but yeah. it's obviously an issue. Just one more time. Yeah. 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 The, uh, I also calculated the precise depth. I came at 64, so it's okay. quite accurate. Yes, just one more technical point. The first shot from no. Spider. There is also an eccentric plaque at the ostium of the left main uh, because there's no contrast, no uh, reflow. It's not critical, but I, I didn't catch it on the IVAS. That may be a consideration for the procedure. Yeah, good point. So the, the, the ostium is okay, Eric. Yes, you, you saw that very first spider shot where there's no contrast reflow from the ostium, but I think it's okay, yeah. Yeah, the ostium uh, l looks okay on IVAS as well, and also on the NGO so far. Oh, it's hard to eject with the four <laughs> millimeter balloon inside. 
Uh, I have not trained my hand enough in the recent years, I think. <laughs> Maybe a question. What is the role of focused force balloons like cutting or any other in this kind yeah. of yeah. indication? Just well, watch your guide, guys, yeah, because yeah, it's yeah. Uh, quite deep throated. Just one, kidding. Uh, this guide is a. Uh, it's a uh, XB3. Yeah, yeah just, just watch it, it's deep throated. So, Su Te, what, what do you think? I mean, Eric raised the point about, you know, using maybe focused force balloons, such as oh, okay. the scoring balloons. Yeah. Or okay, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. What, what, you know, I noticed that you use a very sizable NC balloon 4.0 to predilate. I mean, what's your thought yeah. on that? Yeah, so, so, so we, we were considering that one, but then on the Ivers, it's only about 120 degrees arc, and the other side was actually the origin of the circ as well as the... As the uh, uh, the, the intermediate, almost like intermediate. So it, there will be difficulty for the scoring balloon to, to achieve the desired effect. You probably will just push the, the calcified plug to one side. Yeah, because we only have about 120 degree arc, and then the rest are actually the, the, the relatively, uh, the, the orifice or origin into the, the other two artery. So we think that it may not, uh, we, uh, uh, may not actually achieve the desired cutting effect. Yeah. What do you think? Let's get the. I think we 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 we're, we're look, looking at your post and uh, post dilatation balloon uh, films and see what what your result for, is like. For all for yeah, team. yeah, it's 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 quite hard to inject. <laughs> to say. Um, the I think it looks okay. Yeah, the balloon went up quite all right. Um, that there's that little indentation there. I think that's more an angulation rather than a, a, a true stenosis. I'm, I'm not, I don't really feel like putting in the IVUS again just to have a look. Um, unless someone strongly feels uh, that they want to have a look at the IVUS again. No. no. But, but yeah. uh, I think the, the eccentric yeah. cal cal calcified plug, yeah. You know, yeah, whether by balloon or by cutting balloon or scoring balloon will have some limitation yeah, I think we will expect that there will be some in indentation, some um, some residual stenosis, and uh, yeah, uh, at the side of the eccentric uh, um, calcified plug. Yeah. So um, actually, just now we also when we ran divers down, we were trying to look for the um, uh, a good landing spot. So we've uh, made some measurements. And uh, we're going to go with a 14 millimeter stent, 4014. Hopefully, this uh, will give us good overlap with the proximal LAD and also a little bit of um, stent length in the left main so that we can do a nice pot and optimize the result. From near the ostium of the left main to the um, bifurcation, uh, the distance was approximately only 8 millimeter. Wow, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the pressure is a little bit damp, but I think that's from my uh, two-e manipulation. Okay. Move forward a bit. So just make sure that uh, it's overlapped. I'll just do a dry cine first. Okay. I think yeah. come back yeah. a little bit. Come yeah. yeah. Okay. I give you a little bit. Of yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Oh, I think we're, we're we're definitely overlapped in the uh, yeah. in this view. Come back a bit. I think we should come back, back. a bit more. Actually, yeah, come back. Yeah. Back. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah. That spider view is actually very. Uh, we keep this one a here, little bit deceiving. The other one. Go to the crane. Yeah. So we're just going to keep quiet and just let you focus in doing this because this is obviously a crucial part of your your stand placement. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Senior. <coughs> um, yeah, yeah, might be a little. Uh, just by plane for all first. Yeah, okay. yeah, uh, I, 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 I would okay. Yeah, so it's, so it's around here. Huh? Okay, I take a picture. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, from the RAO cord, uh, you may want to. Yeah, maybe one in a little, little bit. Now, a little yeah. bit, yeah. Okay, yeah. Huh? I, I think, we're, I think just, we're good. Just yeah? in, yeah. in a little. Okay. We we don't it, we don't need to to go yep. to the exact. Yeah. yeah we don't need to stand to the ostium of the left yeah. main. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, okay. All right, yeah. let's go. Ho, yep. ho, ho, holding, ho. holding. Clara. Okay. Okay, yeah. I go slow. Okay, left knee. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 okay, down. Yeah. Okay. We went up to ten and must break pressure. Yeah. 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 I think in, in this kind of left dominant system, we don't want to keep the balloon up too long. It is obviously the balloon, a high risk. Yeah, the balloon case, yeah. seems to have gone up very yeah. nicely in we both use planes. The yeah. Just take the take this up. Take this. Uh, take, take the balloon up. Okay, take the balloon up. It's yeah. difficult to inject. Yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> My hand not not. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Let's take the balloon out. So we, we saw that obviously you put about freedom stands in and I think Philip and I were just discussing, you know, for the left main, is the st does the stand expansion limit going to play a factor here, you know, considering the size of the left main on IFS is, is you know, 5 point something six zero. So we checked last night. <laughs> uh, we did our homework <laughs> last night. Yes. <laughs> at 12 midnight, we got the information that uh, the 4 O stand can maximally be dilated, expanded to 5.9. Wow. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the structural integrity. I think the drug distribution and things <coughs> like that may, may, may be distorted. So we, we try not to. Yeah. Not to uh, go too high. Yeah. Big, big is good, but not too big. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, actually, I, 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 I wouldn't understand how the drug uh, distribution should be distorted at this, uh, at this extent because you don't have a polymer. This is sure, a, sure. a clear, nice advantage, and I think you can open it up uh, much more in the left main. You will need to. Yeah. And also, yeah. I think in the proximal LD, you might want to do a appropriate post dilatation Prepare because a it looked a little bit underexpanded with only ten. Uh, 10 atmospheres implantation. So I think there's no, no, especially with this stent design, there's absolutely no, uh, no thing to be concerned about. The, no, you're absolutely the, right. The, yeah. the vertical geometry may become a little bit straightened. Yeah. So we're going to put the 4 in again. We're going to try and optimize that proximal LED. Um, Prepare a 5.5. 5.5 5 or 5.0? Negative, negative again. Yeah. yeah. This uh, balloon may be. So uh, no, no, so negative. what are you doing now? Yeah, yeah, negative. You're post dilating, or you're doing an Ivers run? I want. Uh, we are, we are gonna post dilate. Uh, okay. Using what? At what level? New balloon. So I think this one there is a possibility that the, now the wi the balloon uh, the it, it probably wire wrap uh, probably wire wrap. Don't you think so? So let's see. The this is a f original 4.0 yeah. non-compliant. We use this just now. So, so we are going to remove uh, one wire first, um, and um, uh, intermediate the high, the so-called high diagonal, the intermediate. I think there are three wire there. It uh, interfere with the the movement, and uh, we shall see whether the balloon can be advanced. If the balloon cannot go in, then we will need to re. Adjust. Uh, so after removal of the uh, intermediate wire, so the balloon went in. So let's, okay, let's, let's uh, check, let's check, yep. check here. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That was our original position. Yeah, that's a nice demonstration yeah. for yeah. the fellows, yeah. isn't it? You know. <laughs> so, so yeah, Andrew, I think, I think that, that is, uh, so we are going up. This one is to 20. We keep the inflation time short. If not for the left main, uh, I would normally keep it at uh, for 20 seconds uh, just to allow the, the matter to uh, re reconform a little bit. So uh, at this location, we have to keep the um, inflation short. So what pressure do you go up to, Sute, just now? Uh, I went up to 18. Yeah, a bit of ST depression. Yeah. It's not uh, unexpected. Okay. Maybe let's take a picture first. Yeah, take a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't we? Hmm? Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Hmm? Can? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Before the balloon is up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 20. Okay, down. So maybe we leave the balloon here. Huh? Okay. It might be easier to inject. Okay. okay. Yeah, All right. Ready? Yeah. Here we go. 
I try not to disappoint you. We'll put it next time. Okay. Oh. You, you've been going to the gym lately, Siddiq. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I need to, to train on this. I think the flow down the diagonal is a bit slow. Yeah. Maybe it's because no, no. the balloon no, is just balloon. blocking it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we will take a. I, I think we, we normally like to check before the balloon is out just to be sure that we don't have to use the prolonged balloon inflation to handle some complications. So the. Uh, but perforation cannot occur. Right, I mean, tamponade, <laughs> tamponade cannot occur. So take. Yeah. Perforation yeah, so can, but tamponade not. Having yeah, said that, yeah, she, yeah. She's, a, so she's had a pericardectomy, so. So, so yes. I mean, uh, yeah. but, uh, having the balloon there at, at the time of the detection of the perforation, we can quickly at least uh, inflate the balloon. I think the, that, that will help, I think. Yeah, so uh, we are going to, would you suggest 5.0 or 5.5? You Next can, balloon can for you the share, left main. share with us what the IVAS measurement was again on the left main? Yeah. I'll look so to yeah. Uh, yeah. It was IVAS actually, for, it's actually 5.5. Five. 5.5 five, five, five towards the distal end, and then the proximal end close to 6 millimeter, actually. So what can choice What choice is your yeah, left main uh, balloon? I presume that's EM to EM? Yeah, 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 the media, the media, yes. Uh, Dr. Yeah. how about the uh, perform uh, I was first, and then you can uh, okay. choose another uh, escalated sure. side. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Yep. My, my okay. Benjo lab looks uh, good, so I, I recommend it to perform I was at first. Okay. But we have both the uh, 5.0 and the 5.5, um, balloon non-compliant balloon ready first, uh, yeah. So, Chi Tang, what are you doing now? Is it Ivers or you? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna put the Ivers in quickly. Yep, uh, have a look at the yep. left main so and uh, also the um, stented segment. Prof Lim, uh, this is Asri Apakaba. Prof Lim, Sutek. yeah, Kaba by Asri. Uh, I saw Selamat your. Datang. <laughs> yo, <laughs> I think the worry here is also dominant circ and things like that. Just the Ivers run. If you're doing Ivers, maybe you can have it a bit faster, at one millimeter per second. Just now was 0.5. so it's a bit slower. We we just want to look at the left main and so maybe one millimeter per second. And then we can see the. Ah, uh, good, 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 yeah, good, good suggestion. You guys can see the Ivers. This one is a proxima uh, LED. The other thing to discuss after this is whether you want to do a kissing. Yeah. So so far it's actually quite well expanded, mm -hmm. well posted, and then when we come back. So that is the side of the uh, eccentric calcified plug that uh, that we push aside, but then uh, still constrain the expansion a little bit. So this is inside the left main. Yep. Clearly, mm, there is yep. a uh, mm. mild Expanded. position. Yeah, there's room for expansion. Yes. <laughs> so Sushik, how? Um, what's your next plan? I mean, you know, we're looking at a clock. I've uh, been reminded we've about 13 yeah. minutes left. Okay, so you probably will be doing the pot, and then we will probably okay. would like to know how Maybe we use a 5.5. .5. Yeah. We use a 5.5. .5. Yeah. Um, and, and also yeah. what your strategy yeah. for, the, for the big vessel, the circumflex, what's your strategy for that? Yeah, so we, we discussed this before. Uh, I don't think much has changed to change our plan. So we're going to pot now with a 5.5. And um, we are not planning to kiss at the, at the bifurcation um, unless something uh, very uh, <laughs> exciting happens. You, you have a 5.5 balloon, this way, yeah? We have a 5.5 five balloon. It's a bit long, but I think uh, the left main actually is very big, so from, from I, I which, don't think it's going to injure the... Which company do you have? Five uh, this is a Boston Scientific. Uh, yeah. Because the biggest yeah. they have NC is 5 image. in our lab. NC yeah. Image. Yeah. Yeah. We are looking for 8 millimeter, but they're not available. We only have a 15. Mm -hmm. So we are going to just... Uh, we will stick it up into the... Yeah. Okay. I think that should be okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If anyone in so the audience, up. if anyone in the audience wants to ask some questions, please go ahead. Use the react That's system, sick. and we will put your questions up on the screen. Okay. One more time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is a very big balloon. Yeah. <laughs> That's a seriously big balloon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
<laughs> Philip, we will use five or five five, Philip. Okay, okay, okay. But it's a good illustration of the point. It's important to, okay, to okay. be aware of the maximum diameter that you can reasonably go for without risking uh, rupture, because acute stent rupture is not something you wish to see if possible. Otherwise, I cannot inject. Yep, yep. Uh, you mean uh, fracture, Philip? Or yeah, that's right. Fracture, sorry, fracture. fracture. Sorry, quite right. Not rupture. Chi Tang and Su is a beautiful illustration on, in, a, in a high bleeding risk patient to, to make sure that the procedure is optimally done. You know, you're going to have a shortened yeah. APD strategy, yeah. I'm sure. So, yeah. so yeah. a perfect yeah. PCI result yeah. is really important. Okay. Okay. Yep. And that looks yeah. good. That looks really good. Yep. And yeah. graphically looks all right. Yeah. Okay. I think we uh, do a quick we will keep it run. simple. And then uh, yeah. hopefully that's it. Okay. We I will think keep it simple. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The patient's doing okay, hemodynamically stable. Um, every time we inflate in the left main, of course, he uh, probably doesn't enjoy it very much, but um, otherwise, he's, he's okay. How high did you go with the 5.5 balloon just now? Just now, went up to 16. All right. But we stick out a fair bit into the aorta. Yeah. So yeah. didn't cross into the LED. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So we may put one to to get the guide out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the final Ivers run, they are proximal LED back. Yeah, here inside the yeah. So the one o'clock is the sub wire. Yeah. After this, we are going to do the measurement uh, of light to, to see that. So now this is inside the left main. Yeah. I think it's better apples, yeah. uh, better expanded, but they will still be at from 7 to 9 o'clock. Yeah, will still be a little bit yeah. area of mild position, I think. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I okay. think we, 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 are, we are happy with this. Yes. Uh, the, the, we will stick to the original plan. It looks, it looks really good. It looks really good. Yeah. So the plan is to give only one month of DAPT and then uh, subsequently switch to Copidogrel and, uh, and PPI. The, um, because previously uh, there was a bleeding from the gastric ulcer while on the aspirin and PPI. Suta and Chitang, you, you'll be pleased that to know that the main arena is absolutely packed we have a full house watching you. In fact, I'm going to ask people who are standing in the back to move forward. There are actually still a few empty seats in the front. You know, please come forward and, and sit in the front. I think that is. I think that looks fine. Yeah. yeah. I don't think we need to kiss or anything. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. Yeah. So our wires are out. So we're going to see your final shots, and then maybe we can we have some time, and we can do a bit of react, and we can get the feedback from from you and yep. discuss the, uh, with our panelists and yeah. audience. Oh, that's a beautiful, beautiful picture. All right. Yeah. Two cream. Uh, Dr. Lim, I have a, a question. Still, do you believe the left main coverage is uh, the best uh, strategy for this patient? Just a uh, uh, LAD or st just small protrusion is uh, okay for this patient? Left main coverage or not? Yeah, that, that, that was another alternative. Yeah, the, a small protrusion. Yeah. Okay, because yeah. the left main uh, pro uh, intervention is kind of a highly uh, pro uh, procedure for uh, thrombosis. So it's a kind of a HBL patient, but it's a kind of a high thrombotic risk patient. So it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a complicated issue issues we have. Yeah, yep, I think yeah. that's a good thing. We can discuss that later. Yeah, on the RAO quarter view, we can see that there is actually the plug extending a little bit from the mid um, body of the the left, the short left mid, yeah, yeah along the superior border into the. Uh, uh, Austria already. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Th thank you, everybody. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. That was really a, quite an amazing case. I think it's, it's incredibly good teaching value because this patient illustrates the extreme difficulties you can get yourself into. There are a number of very good reasons why he absolutely needs intervention to his osteal LED, and there are a number of reasons why you would far rather keep him at home and not even think of touching him. And so it's a trade-off between thrombosis and bleeding, and you've got to get your strategy optimized. And it's not going to be easy, and whatever you do, you may regret it. But uh, at least they now, our colleagues have got a very nice acute result with an intelligent strategy of keeping it simple, which I think is entirely appropriate for this sort of patient. And so we can now hopefully address a few questions and discuss with them. Yeah. Are there any comments from the panel before we... I, I think it's very tempting to just uh, stand the osteo LED in this patient, but given all the comorbids, and you know, it's a dominant circumflex and so on. But if you look at the IVERS and also the NGO, the distal, I mean, there's no landing zone. The distal left mean the, the plug burden is more than 50%. So if you were to, to go to osteal LED, in my opinion, you might need to come back. There's a risk of, you know, high risk, risk stenosis and so on. So you have to take, I, I believe, the jump. And I think, and the left mean was rather short. So I think they did the right thing in going into the body of the left mean. There was a mention earlier from Tony, and maybe I want to hear the opinion from Andrew, you know, you know keeping the stand across the left main in terms of uh, thrombotic risk. You know, Tony has some concern that this might actually add on to the uh, thrombotic risk here, and if you want to shorten the DAPT, that might be counterintuitive. What's your, what's your thought on that, Andrew? Um, I, I think we need to cross the, the left main because this is a Medina 1-1-0. Clearly, you can see in this picture that you've got up on the screen here that the, uh, the left, the plug burden extends back into the left main. So I think what Chi Tang and uh, Tzu Tig did was absolutely right, and I fully agree with them. Um, the, the, the nice thing is that the ostium of the circumflex is disease-free, and that's, that's in the patient's favor. So single stand strategy um, covering the disease, the disease segment, oh, it's good. Um, and then I think that uh, now we have one, dr one drug eluting stent that, that has a one month indication in the setting of uh, ACS. I think that's important. This, this patient has had an ACS. So uh, I think that you know, this patient's had the best treatment today, um, given the fact that this patient um, you know, is basically immobile um, and, and is not gonna be rehabilitable until he has his, his ischemia treated. And this is so someone whose EF has gone from normal down to 33%. You know, there's a good chance this is all hibernating with, um, with, no, with preservation of the R waves. This is all hibernating myocardium and he will now recover and he will then you know, hopefully be on the, 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 the upslope for recovery um, going forward for him. We, we have two questions that are showing up there. Um, one was, what about the management of this patient if he was on warfarin? I mean, how bad can it get? Uh, I don't know if I would dare put a patient with cirrhosis, esophageal, varicose, varicose veins on warfarin, but I don't think it would change anything really, uh, except the fact that you might think that he's better off left alone. Yeah, correct, I agree. I mean, I don't think anyone in the right mind will put the patient on, on warfarin here. And then th there was a question about the diagonal. Um, I remember a very nice case of Antonio Colombo when they were asking him what, he, what his strategy was for the diagonal. He said, my strategy is to call the diagonal small. And I think in this case, it's entirely appropriate that this is a, not a very big vital vessel. This patient has got so many problems that diagonal doesn't matter a whole lot. We have our colleagues back with us now, so we can have some questions. Yeah. Congratulations to Tekken and Chitang, lovely case. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, yeah. I, I saw a, a question here, I would rather deploy stentis for this large left main. And I've used a lot of stentis. Let, 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 let me tell you, stentis, the, the, the stent uh, shrug thickness is about 132 microns, and the second generation uh, polysulfone polymer coating. So the problem in this patient, I think the big issue is DAPT, you know, the high risk of bleeding. And if you give, if you put something on stentis, although it could be a good choice to take up the, you know, the, the, the discrepant left main and LED, but the issue will be bleeding and uh, DAPT and so on. You cannot give one month DAPT, giving, uh, putting the patient on stentis. Just that we don't have data yet huh, for the optimal duration with the stentis, yes. But we have data from the leaders free for biofreedom. The, the audience raised a question about the diagonal, and we kind of talked about it before we were getting ready. I mean, the comment was that the ostiums of the diagonal look pinched and should it be wired first. We thought you actually wired it, but you took it out because it was getting in the way of your NC balloon. But what's your view on the diagonal? 
Yeah, the, um, the diagonal was uh, wired during the first uh, intervention as well, and um, you know it was left there. The flow was okay after the first intervention, but as we kind of expected, uh, after today's stenting, uh, the flow was um, not as brisk. But um, I think rewiring that diagonal, doing some uh, kissing at that diagonal bifurcation would have made things much more complex. Um, we also don't really want to go and disrupt that uh, that stent. It looks quite nice on the uh, IVUS. I think, you know, distorting stent architecture for the sake of uh, one branch, um, uh, especially in this patient, I'm I'm not sure that the uh, so-called advantages uh, outweigh um, le just leaving it alone. So that's why we decided just leave it alone. Uh, actually, there are two branches close to each other. One is the high diagonal. One is the very high OM that actually look very much like intermediate. The one, the very high OM, actually already had a pre-existing tight stenosis at the Austin. Yeah. So actually, the final picture showed a good flow, Dimitri flow in the the, the so-called high diagonal. So I think, uh, like uh, the comment earlier, I think it's best uh, keep the whole procedure simple. What would you, what 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 are you going to do about following this man's hemoglobin? You start with 8.8, .8, so you're close to transfusion level. Presumably, you haven't done it, but you'll want to watch him over the next few weeks. And also, what about dosing and choice of uh, proton pump inhibitors? Because this could be important for this man. Yeah, so um, Sutik is going to follow him up very closely because uh, he's, uh, he's actually his patient. Um, but we've, we've been discussing this. Um, I think yesterday, uh, this, um, I, if I remember, you were suggesting maybe even day, uh, weekly full blood count checks. Uh, that's certainly possible. Um, not sure if that's what we will actually do, but uh, we definitely need to keep a very close eye on his uh, on his hemoglobin. He'll probably be reviewed in our clinic maybe within two to four weeks. Um, and so I think the latest that we can recheck his hemoglobin is in two weeks' time. Um, the plan, obviously, is to keep the DAPT duration as short as possible. Um, so, you know, ideally one month. Um, and, um, you know, I think PPI is very important in this patient. Um, he's already had one GI bleed. Um, we don't want him to have GI bleeds again. Uh, as to the choice of PPI, um, I think we can discuss this further. Uh, typically, we use omeprazole. Um, I'm not entirely sure if uh, one PPI conveys um, significant advantage over the uh, over another. Uh, having said that, he's on clopidogrel, um, but I think we will still keep him. Um, he's currently on isomeprazole mainly because he's NG fat, um, but it's possible that he will be converted to uh, omeprazole later. Kang. It, yep. Here, the choice is dictated to a large extent also by the cost. I think the, here in Singapore, o generic omeprazole is a lot cheaper than the pentoprazole, even uh, though there is uh, this concern about the pharmacological interaction yep. being uh, probably less with yep. the pentoprazole compared yep. to omeprazole. Tang, I'm but probably clinically, it probably doesn't. Yeah, we probably have to go because the transmission yeah. is cutting out. Okay. Once again, can we just give you a round of applause for the fantastic case? Okay. And congratulations. Thank you, once again. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Philip, thank you very, very much. All, all, all of you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. See you soon. Okay, we're now followed by a, a rapid series of lectures. And I think these are small, short lectures that will cover quite a lot of topics. So, you know, first of all, I would invite my co-chair, uh, Dr. Philip Herben uh, from Switzerland to talk about the pioneering the new world of high being risk patients. Thank you, Philip. Paul, uh, members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to rapidly go over some salient points of uh, what we currently know about HBR. Uh, we first, of course, have to know who we're talking about. And a rough and ready definition would be those people who need short DAPT, and we all know who they are. They are people who have major surgery planned, who've had a recent stroke, who are already anemic, or who are bl recently bled or transfused, who need anticoagulants, who have documented or suspected cancer, who are going to require surgery or chemotherapy, and finally, the elderly and the frail. All of those we would usually put in the ballpark of uh, high bleeding risk patients. And in fact, when we look at the leaders free trial and we had selected 13 inclusion criteria, the six criteria that were most frequently applied were advanced age, oral anticoagulants, renal failure, surgery planned, anemia, recent transfusion or cancer. And if we look at what other people have been doing um, in the trials that are either ongoing or planned, we can see again the inclusion criteria defining the HBR population 
and those that are most frequently used are age with varying cutoffs, oral anticoagulants, anything to do with anemia, transfusion and bleeding, and thrombocytopenia. And then there are some other inclusion criteria like liver disease that we did use at Leaders Free and we'll come back to that because it's interesting relative to this patient that we just saw today. What can we do to decrease bleeding? Really, there are three major avenues. One is access, and we don't want to spend too much time talking about that. Uh, of course, it's sometimes not feasible because of uh, the need to preserve radial uh, vessels for uh, dialysis, for instance. But certainly, one of the recent large trials with the Matrix, Marco Valgamigli and others, 8,000 plus ACS patients, radial versus femoral, randomized, the bleeding, bark three or five, so serious bleeding, was significantly decreased by a radial access, and it all happened within four or five days, as one would expect. And the all-cause mortality was going the same way with a p-value of 0.045. And often, all-cause mortality and bleeding go together. So radial every time you can. And choosing the stent, well, we've just had a nice example of the uh, biofreedom, and it is, we think, um, one of the most solidly documented devices for a really short DAPT. Uh, we know that it's better than a bare metal stent in terms of efficacy, it decreases TLR. In terms of safety, there's less cardiac death, MI, and stent thrombosis. And the bleeding, of course, was similar to that observed with a bare metal stent because that's driven by drug treatment, which was the same in both arms, but it was high, 7%. Is there an interest for short DAPT? Yes. Is it important? Yes, it's massive. You see here, there are 14 planned or ongoing, or actually one of them completed trials using second generation drug eluting stents for short DAPT, which in this case I've defined as three months or less. Eight of these trials are going for one month or less. And so obviously the six others are going for uh, longer or a combination of longer and shorter. We have to accept the fact that if these trials are ongoing, it's because we don't know yet how other uh, stents with slower uh, elution uh, will do with shorter DAPT. I think all very important and very interesting. And then choice of antithrombotics, of course. And again, an interesting change that happened last year, looking at the focused update on DAPT uh, published in 2017. If you're going to have PCI, you're either stable or unstable. If you're stable, you either have a metallic stent, a bare metal stent, or a drug-coated balloon, or you have a resorbable stent, or perhaps I should say you had a resorbable stent. And then if you're getting one of the metallic stents, then either you are or not a high bleeding risk. So the algorithm has become much clearer. If you're not an HBR, you should have six months DAPT. If you are an HBR, then you can have either three months for most of DES or one month it's only a 2BC, appropriately, but that would actually cover, for the moment, in those guidelines, only the uh, biofreedom. And the other drug thing that it's really important to remember is the whole story of uh, proton pump inhibitors. If we look at the major bleeding in leaders free, 7% at one year, as you remember, nearly half these events were driven by gastrointestinal bleeding. So we have to focus on that and less than two-thirds of patients in leaders free actually left the hospital after their index procedure on PPIs. So we can improve on that. We have to remember it. So to conclude this very short overview, um, we now know that these patients are there, and we have to modify our practice to account for their specific needs. We have to go radial, which is true, of course, for non-HBR. We should not use bare metal stents because there is no reason other than economic to use those. We can use as a default approach three months with a DES and one month with a DCS as a basic uh, start. We should never forget proton pump inhibitors. And really, we should also remember that each of these patients is different. Not everybody has a precise DAP score of 70 plus. But once you've assessed the patient, his bleeding and his thrombotic risk, you can make a guided judgment on the duration and type of a DAPT. Thank you very much. We will have time for discussion, so um, thank you very much, Philip. Can I uh, ask uh, Michael, Michael Lee from Hong Kong, to follow up on the next lecture? Okay, so we're going to focus on Asia this time. So it's in APAC, high bleeding risk guidelines and optimization. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Paul. Um, 
Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm quickly go through with you our uh, consensus uh, paper, which to be published soon. Uh, we have actually um, uh, came up with this group of uh, cardiologists. Some of them are on the stage uh, t today. That, uh, we think high bleeding risk is a particular risk, a particular problem in uh, Asia. We don't have proper uh, consensus on how to manage, how to identify this patient. So we came together in July last year and uh, draft this sort of um, a consensus paper uh, uh, just to highlight um, some of the important points. So first of all, we, we, we will have to look at the impact of the problem in Asia. So we suggest uh, all physicians in the Asia Pacific region should develop hospital based or actually um, uh, through collaboration, more specific countries based registries to help to characterize and estimate the number of patients with high breathing risk in their region, in their country. We've um, seen uh, various trials try to identify the predictors of this uh, increased bleeding, both in ACS, in atrial fibrillation, in uh, PCIs, and uh, they all come up to more or less similar predict, uh, predictors uh, of increased risk. So we would, um, after our systematic uh, uh, identification approach to identify these patients, we would suggest to include uh, at least some of these items below, such as age, for um, aging population, elderly more than 75, uh, and take into account their felty, felty score, and for patients uh, who are actually low in the body mass index, uh, short and uh, thin patients, anticipated invasive procedure surgery in the next three to six months, and uh, concomitant oral anticoagulation, recent bleeding, renal impairment, anemia. So you can see all, all these factors are actually more or less uh, um, similar to all the other uh, trials uh, in which uh, 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 these predictors actually can identify sort of uh, very high bleeding risk patients uh, going for PCR procedures. And then we concentrate on the periprocedural um, techniques and practices. We would suggest, as uh, Philip has mentioned, transradial approach in preference to transfemoral. And we would suggest use the newer generation DES in preference to the bare metal stand as, so as we can give shorter duration of dual antiplatelet. So as seen in the live case, single stand approach, even for complex bifurcation lesions is uh, suggested whenever possible. And uh, liberal use of PPIs. In uh, Asia, we are seeing, uh, of course, uh, 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 thinner patients with lower BMI, and then we are seeing actually more hemorrhage in terms of bleeding complications, intracranial hemorrhage after patients are giving different types of uh, newer anticoagulants. So uh, with that, we are actually concentrate a lot on the antithrombotic therapies in this group of patients. So we would uh, suggest uh, for stable patients, avoid preloading before you contemplate PCI. And then dual antiplatelet should be kept to a minimum of uh, one month as far as possible, or at most three to six months. And then uh, we should not uh, perform play function tests for, uh, routinely, as uh, recommended in the guideline. And all anticoagulants with uh, uh, newer, anti newer agents is generally, generally preferable to warfarin. Uh, but uh, if possible, we should use them at the lowest effective dose. And then if we are going to use warfarin, we try to keep the iron out at a lower level. What we suggest is about 1.8 to 2. And this is supported by a local evidence. And uh, more specifically for Muslim countries, we would suggest a, a special consideration when we use these uh, 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 com recombinant proteins from the porcine source. So lastly, we would suggest uh, the uh, uh, a multidisciplinary approach. Try to form a bleeding team in your uh, locality which involves surgeons, anesthesiologists, hematologists, cardiologists, try to see what is the optimal timing of the procedure and the uh, antithrombotic therapy uh, after the uh, post-PCI uh, uh, period. So in conclusion, what our group has suggested is that it is very important to identify this group of patients, high breathing risk patients, and develop uh, uh, hospital and country-specific uh, registries during the uh, PCI procedures, we have to consider uh, the various uh, detailed um, approach, stands used, and various techniques, try to keep as simple as possible. 
and uh, special considerations for Asian patients on this antithrombotic therapy and their multidisciplinary bleeding team approaches are actually our um, suggestion to tackle this uh, very complex group of patients. Uh, these are the two meetings that you can come to Hong Kong. Uh, one is on complication and one is HICT. Thank you for your kind attention. Okay, and we'll move on, and we'll have time to discuss um, in a moment. And the next speaker is Chris uh, Naba, who's going to tell us about the two-year results of the Leaders Free ACS subset, a really interesting uh, subset of that trial. Christoph. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, what puzzles me all the time when we come together for these uh, sessions on high bleeding risk patients is that the room is full. This was the first time when the landmark trial Leaders Free was presented, and um, this shows for me clearly that uh, trials like Leaders Free provide an answer to a problem we really have. So I'm speaking here on behalf of the Leaders Free uh, investigators. And um, now, the, the Leaders Free trial demonstrated that um, if we implant the BioFreedom BA9 um, drug coated stent compared to a bare metal stent, then there is an advantage not only in efficacy, what we can expect, but also in safety for our patients. And one patient group which is of particular importance is patients with an acute coronary syndrome. Why? Because we have to give them a lot of antithrombotic agents, and maybe some of them are even a warfarin, so to make it even worse. Now, um, we could show that also for acute coronary syndrome patients, this, was, um, uh, this uh, treatment regimen was not only effective, but also uh, significantly safer um, than to treat uh, than to take a bare metal stent. And what we present here for the really for the first time, that is uh, the analysis of the two year results of Leaders Free ACS. Now this is the Leaders Free ACS cohort and this cohort does not significantly differ from the cohort we had in uh, Leaders Free. Um, you can see that the diabetic range is around 80%, uh, sorry, 30%. Um, we had a higher number of non-STEMI patients and STEMI patients, and uh, relatively complex patients with a lot of patients with previous PCI. <coughs> um, so um, this is the procedural data, and you can see that it's uh, not small vessels, vessel size is around 3.0, um, relatively long stent length, relatively high amount of overlapping stents, so relatively complex patients. And these were the results. Efficacy was significant and also the safety. Now what will happen after two years? Oh, sorry, this is uh, still after one year and I could show you different endpoints. We could see that even cardiac death was significant, myocardial infarction uh, difference was significant, and you could see a strong trend in, uh, in stent thrombosis. And you could see that both uh, groups were bleeding, and this underlines that uh, the right cohort were included in the Leaders Free trial. Now, this is after two years. You see the primary safety endpoint, and you see the primary efficacy endpoint. And what really puzzles me, if you look at these curves, there is no, they are, they are still running apart from each other. They are not moving um, uh, uh, to each other. So the advantage that we saw after the first year on the primary safety and also on the primary efficacy remains absolutely stable over the two years. And if you look at the different endpoints from the primary safety endpoint, cardiac death, myocardial infarction, and even definite and probable centromosis, you can see that the curves are not moving to each other. They are staying apart. So the advantage clearly um, stays and the advantage clearly stays after two years. These are the single endpoints, and I just want to point here also at, uh, the bleeding, uh, at the bleeding of the patients. You can see they are really at a high bleeding risk. Um, we can see that uh, around 24% uh, percent of the patients are bleeding after two years. Now, let me come to the conclusion. In high bleeding risk patients with an acute coronary syndrome, safety and efficacy benefits of the BA9 drug-coated biofreedom stent over a bare metal stent. Both had only one month dual antiplatelet therapy, persisted during the 24 months of follow-up. And I think these findings to further discourage the use of bare metal stents in these patients, and so like the case we saw in, uh, in the life case, we saw the bare metal stent result was good. 
But if we place a, a drug called Tisent, we can only give four weeks of dual antibiotic therapy, but we increase the chance of the patient to have a safer and more effective result. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph, and we'll be able to discuss all this in a minute, but we first have another important uh, presentation by Dr. Uh, Kuo Feng Yu from uh, Taiwan, and he's going to tell us about the emergency patient, STEMI HBR patients with polymer-free BA9 coated stent, a very important subset that we probably don't know quite enough about yet. Uh, thanks, Chairperson, dear panelists and our audience. Uh, then I will show my case uh, with a STEMI, which is a high-risk breeding uh, using a biofreedom. I'm Dr. Guo from Taiwan. Uh, I do not have any conflict of interest. This is a 46 years old male, 170 centimeter and a 96 kilogram. He got ICH in, uh, 19, uh, in uh, 2012, August, which is related to hypertension under medical control, and he's also diabetic, but however, the control was not well. So he got diabetic necropathy, which is the, in CKD stage four. Uh, he's also hypertensive. He came to local hospital, complained about a chest pain with cold sweating one day prior to local hospital. And, uh, and there, STEMI inferior was impressed, but however, the primary PCI failed at local hospital, so he was referred to our hospital for core intervention. This is the ECG. You can see the, in our department, emergency department, you can see the ST elevation over inferiority, and, but however, recorded it have also some ST elevation. So the vital sign was not so good. The blood pressure was not only 96, and the heart rate was 42. You can see uh, the low atrial rhythm on uh, previous ECG. The creatinine was 3.9, and the EG bar uh, was uh, 32. So um, because of uh, ongoing chest pain and the not well hemodynamic, so we just do the coronary intervention for this patient. And this is the angiogram of the patient. You can see the AV function was not so well. You can see the some thrombus in the AV middle portion, and the circumference was not dominant. However, as you see the right coronary, you may see, oh my God. Because it's a dominant right coronary and uh, it was totally occluded and even, I don't know, this is a dissection or a thrombus inside the right coronary plasma portion. So this is double vessel disease. However, it also got a thrombus formation related to, hypo related to hypotension or not. I'm not sure, but I did see a thrombus in LAD. So I decided to do the intervention for both arteries. Um, what is this patient high risk for bleeding according to the leader three data? This is a poor, poor renal function and previous ICH, and I guess the DAPT compliance was not well in this patient because he's a poor compliance to OHA. So I, I guess DAPT uh, compliance was not good. So using bifreden in such kind of case, I think it's better than bare metal stand. So I will do the uh, LED and the right coronary on the same time, and I put the IBP. But because of a female approach with obesity, 96 ki kilogram and passport 2B3A inhibitor, so in acute stage, it is also very high risk for bleeding. So I just do a thrombus suction in LAD, and this is after thrombus suction without stand. And I can see the flow just got improved. The major problem is the right coronary. I put an IBP, but the right coronary is not easy to engage. Uh, as I engage, I'm not sure using the Jenkins right, it is in the dissection flap or just in the RCA Austin. Actually, the wire cannot advance. So I change my guiding caster to M plus one guiding caster using CN wire with the Michael's micro caster. The micro caster can advance. This is the micro tip of the micro caster, and this is the uh, M plus one guiding caster. I think I change the axis, then the wire can pass. And this is the wiring, but however, the wire was not easy to pass because of the very tortuous vessel. And after repeat and several attempts, you can see now, uh, you, can make, you may figure it out that the artery runs like this way. It was very, very tortuous. It's like this way. So it's not easy to advance the wire, but however, it's our fortune, we just pass the wire to the RCA distal portion, and then we do the IVAS. However, under seven fresh guiding, guiding caster, the IVAS still cannot advance. So I use the six French guideliner to pass the IVAS to the middle to distal portion, but the IVAS caster cannot advance beyond the bending portion of the middle to distal right coronary. So this is the most distal part the IVAS can pass. 
Why I do IVAS is because I want to make sure I am in dissection flap or I am in true lumen. But by the long view, I can I see I think I'm in a true lumen. So what we left is uh, repeat and repeat thrombo suction using STO1 and using uh, thrombo uh, thrombo suction. And uh, this is after repeated thrombo suction, and you can see the flow is better at a distal portion. And in such kind of vessels, I always believe the dollar caster to, de to deliver stents. So I use anchor balloon here to deliver, to advance the dollar caster, the guy liner, to advance the stand. And this is the first bar freedom for all. And this is the second, sorry. Oh, sorry. This is after the first uh, bar freedom. And this is second stand and the uh, third stand within five. Uh, zero high pressure post dilatation, which is very compatible with the five freedom. It can be it can done uh, maybe in five point two five. So this is the final angiogram using the IBP. The procedure time is uh, eighty six minutes, and the contrast was to a follow uh, PT one hundred and fifty. I sent the patient to HT after case study, and IV was removed three days later. Discharge one week later. Echo show EF was forty one, and I held aspirin after one month of DBT. But the patient still doing well till now, which is after two years. So my take home message is that for HPR patient, including patient with uh, poor drug compliance, which we which uh, really uh, we should pay attention to. Uh, using bifreden is uh, better than bare metal. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, thank you. So we have a bit of time uh, to discuss among ourselves uh, on the high bleeding risk uh, patients. I have to say, you know, last, if I look at the case that was transmitted live, a few years back, some of these patients will probably never even attempt them. It's just with the technology we have today. And today, you know, early on, we also heard Michael talking about the Asia Pacific side. The you know the bleeding risk is slightly different, maybe compared with the Europeans. You know, Professor uh, uh, Huen from Korea have you know written quite a lot of uh, articles on this. I, I just interested in your view about you know the the thrombotic and the bleeding risk in our part of the world. How, you know, can you just share with us what's your view on those? Uh, actually, uh, Asians uh, it's kind of so multiple races. Uh, my main concern is uh, we just focusing on the East Asian because uh, East Asian is so different to South Asian. Uh, they're so different actually. Uh, so with these three, we uh, almost finished the, our consensus uh, paper for the antiplate uh, treatment uh, in East Asian uh, after PCI uh, or HS. Uh, uh, we will be uh, published in Nature Review Cardiology in the next next month. So. Uh, in this paper, we uh, focus on the so, uh, different profile of the bleeding because uh, East Asians uh, more ch uh, chance of bleeding uh, is so related with the more GI bleeding with the uh, H. pylori and the uh, CRP polymorphism. The another issue is related to the ICH is uh, because uh, East Asians they more uh, uh, ha uh, patients have a, uh, have a more chance of uh, lacuna impa and the more chance of uh, uh, hemorrhage transformation. So based on the uh, multiple kinds of uh, Antiplated and uh, 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 treatment uh, experience. They all show the East Asian, not for the, uh, I'm not sure for the South Asian, but East Asians, uh, they have more chance of bleeding, uh, even during the uh, chronic phase. So another issue is related with uh, these three, we uh, widely use the uh, rail uh, standard for East Asian, but main issue, the pharmacokinetic data uh, for East Asian, so even though we use the same dosage of parasurel ticolor, their uh, uh, blood level is so higher, uh, almost 30%, 40%. Even after the body weight adjustment is 20% is more higher. So uh, more uh, bleeding tendency, uh, more uh, drug response. So in this case, it's what happened for the East Asian. So uh, I'm not sure for the poor uh, acute pain, so we need to use a strong uh, agent, but after one or three months, so we need to uh, step down this kind of the uh, escalation strategy, uh, especially for East Asian. It's a, it's a bottom line of the, our consensus document for East Asian uh, patients. Okay, so uh, <coughs> from what you're telling us, everything that we're talking about in terms of high bleeding risk, we have to give a magnification factor for, South, for, for East Asia. Yeah. So a very important message for this room. Comments and questions from the panel? I think this is a, from what has been presented, 
Um, at the moment, I'm from Sydney, Australia, but at the moment I have a fellow from, uh, from Denmark. And he tells me that in his lab, um, they are putting me in drug-eluting stents, but they've got rid of all their bare metal stents. They've now replaced all their bare metal stents with, um, with biofreedom stents because of the short DAPT required. So I think you know, if, if, if price is not a consideration, then therefore this is an excellent maneuver where you can, you can uh, have an eff efficacious stent, a more efficacious stent uh, with a shorter uh, DAPT duration. And that makes sense to me, but it's something worth thinking about. Absolutely, I can only agree. In my hospital, we have not used a bare metal scent for the past two years uh, for that exact same reason, absolutely. Um, perhaps Actually, a comment, uh, sorry. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Kuo, uh, a question to uh, Kuo. Uh, can I ask you, Dr. Kuo? Yeah, because uh, Please. Yeah, the STEMI patient, the young patient, the so long stent, the big size RCA, uh, just a one month stent and the, the switch with aspirin is okay. How do you think it's okay? Because uh, RCA is a big size, it's a low, uh, so flow is so slow. It's, yeah. it's a trade off, you're right, and it's a judgment call. This man, I understand, had an intracerebral hemorrhage one year before. But it's a hypertension, I see. It's not That's right. So it, I would argue if it was my patient, I think I'd try and see whether his compliance with his blood pressure regimen is reasonable, things like that. If he's running 190, 200 systolic regularly, then you might think that it's a reasonable choice to shorten DAPT. If not, you might prefer to give six months. I think uh, although the uh, biofreedom has been documented to be far superior to a bare metal stent with one month's DAPT, we shouldn't come home thinking that one month is a solution for everybody in every case, every time you put this stent in. It can't be true. And so there must be people for whom a little longer is a better bet. And this man may have been one of those. At least you're telling me that, that would, yeah. that's what you would yeah. have done. Yeah, quite. But what other members of the panel? For a STEMI patient with three biofreedoms, this the patient we were shown from Taiwan. I, I think one of the issues, sorry, was that um, Dr. Kuo mentioned that he was concerned about the compliance of the patient. So, so that's why he, you know, on the basis of risk versus benefit and, and, and whatever else, he, he thought that uh, you know some a, a safe stent would be would be suitable, and and, and as you say, uh, uh, biofreedom stent is, is is more efficacious than a bare metal with the same amount of bleeding as a bare metal. Um, so, so I think, you know, that's, to me, it makes sense. And I mean, uh, implanting a biofreedom doesn't mean that you cannot give a longer dual antiplatelet if you want to. You can, but you are, you know absolutely for sure, and you know from a prospective randomized trial and not from a retrospective analysis that, that you can stop and you have a, a, a safety benefit and the efficacy benefit. So I think this is uh, the real point. You can give it for three months or six months because many patients are at a certain risk of bleeding and if we know that it's a gastric bleeding, at a certain point we can take that risk. If it's a, a cerebral bleeding, well, we might not want to take it, but if it's a, it's a gastric bleeding, we can take it and if we see the patient is bleeding, then we need to stop. Yeah. I think that's a very good point. You, you kind of have the freedom just focusing on the clinical situation of the patient and not the, let the stand burden you with your dual APD duration. I think that's the beauty of bowel freedom here. Any any questions from the audience or any any comments from the panelists? Yes, Paul. Um, yeah, in, in Indonesia maybe the, the situation is not as as uh, as in the other countries because uh, economy is still a big consideration for us. But uh, I just want to ask uh, maybe the Prof Urban regarding the we still use bare metal stand especially for the big size vessel or in short let's say four or four five or five o and uh, the length of uh, less than than let's say twelve or fourteen. So what do you think is still is it a benefit or so what is it? No, I mean, you're quite right. I think the risk of restenosis uh, and problems in, in those situations you describe is low. But then there is no advantage of a bare metal stent over a, of a DCS uh, biofreedom except price. But except price can be a very, very important issue. And if it means you can't treat the patient because no one's going to pay for it, then of course a bare metal stent is a very good option, definitely. I'm, I'm from Malaysia and uh, I'm from a public hospital. 10 years ago, 70% drug uh, bare metal stands. Five years ago, 30% bare metal. In the last two years, uh, almost zero bare metal. So as you said, as costs come down now, and then uh, we're having even difficulty actually buying bare metals because we can't promise we can use them. So they get expired, so we'll stop using. 
almost not using the maximum maximum maximum. Maximum difference of price uh, uh, between DMS and the DS in Malaysia? Uh, it used to be a lot different, but now maybe 30% uh, difference or 20% difference, so not so much like last time was 100% difference. So it used to be less than half. Now it's no more the case. I think what we also need to convince, and this is a question of, of, of uh, regional health authorities, that um, a, a bleeding advantage and, uh, 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 let's say, safety advantage and efficacy advantage uh, immediately translate to an advantage for, uh, for the economy also. I mean, it depends on how, how things are paid for, but at the end, it translates into a real advantage which, which can be seen in the healthcare system. So it could be something that, you know, maybe Donny need to work with you know, on, on a cost-effective basis, you know, considering the, the, you know, the money saved from the bleeders, whether you can actually justify it, but it certainly opened up a, a very different, you know, medical economical uh, discussion here. Another group of patients we see high bleeding risk are atrial fibrillation patients, but not by virtue of atrial fibrillation, but virtue of the treatment of anticoagulation. So when we look at our cases in uh, Southeast Asia, it's about 0.5 to 2% of the population. And coming back to your question about South Asians, there are not many studies, you know, when we go through uh, the Indian subcontinent and things like that on molecular level and things like that. But uh, in Malaysia, there have been studies uh, comparing, uh, we find that, as you say, Chinese have like, for example, high risk of uh, antiplatelet resistance to clopidogrel and things like that. But there is some variation, I, I believe. Uh, but there's still a lot of studies yet to be done for South Asians. I think, you know, in we've more or less come to a very good conclusion here. So what I'd like to do is invite my co-chair, uh, Dr. Philip Urban, to just round up the sessions and just share with us his final wisdom. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Bob. So three more minutes. Key learning points, take home message. We saw what I think we could rightly call a VHBR, very high bleeding risk patient from the National Heart Center. And we, I think it's been shown conclusively by this distinguished panel and the operators that really we're facing a choice where we have risks on both sides, no question. On the thrombosis side, there was dialysis, prior stenting, recurrent non-STEMI, uh, difficult location. On the bleeding side, there was renal failure, it plays both ways, cirrhosis, severe anemia, moderate thrombocytopenia, recent spontaneous bleeding, and precise dapt through the ceiling. <clears throat> so that's the sort of decision we have to face with HBR patients. And perhaps interesting for this particular patient, I've listed here the relative in gray thrombotic and in red bleeding risk according to the inclusion criteria in the leaders free trial. Now you could, patients could have several of these, but if we look at the worst bleeding risk, that was liver disease, hemoglobin below 11 grams per deciliter, prior bleeding, and renal failure. This patient we saw from Singapore had all four of these. So we can imagine his bleeding risk must be dramatic. And you see, for instance, for liver patients, the bleeding risk is massively increased in a small number of patients, uh, and the thrombotic risk is not particularly high. It's very important to remember these things because when you look at multivariate analysis, because these patients are rare, they never come out in the predictors. But when that happens to be the problem of your patient on your table like this morning, it becomes his biggest bleeding problem. So when you're reading literature, you have to remember also to think about individual patients. So the take home for that patient was use meticulous technique as was beautifully illustrated this morning. Aim for a simple procedure. If you have a tremendous result with too much metal, you probably put yourself in a corner. Limit DAPT. I think monitor hemoglobin closely. This man has no margin of safety. If he drops by two grams per deciliter, he's going to be very unhappy. And of course, use uh, PPIs. We heard from uh, Dr. Lee that it would be of tremendous interest to have country-specific and region-specific registries to learn more precisely about that problem of the balance of thrombosis and uh, bleeding, which is not the same in different parts of the world, especially in East Asia. We heard from Christoph that there was good news with the two-year follow-up of the ACS uh, subset, which was uh, a major piece of information presented uh, in 2016 at EuroPCR, and we know now that it holds out to two years. There is no catch-up, which is very reassuring for us to know about. And we heard um, from uh, Taiwan and Dr. Yu that 
uh, STEMI patients were different. And I think there's one interesting point to make as well, is very often, because we're told that we have to rush to the lab, appropriately so, and we save lives by doing that, usually, certainly in my hospital, we don't have a full medical history, and even less creatinine values, hemoglobin, so on and so forth. So sometimes you stent the patient, and it's only next morning you find out that he was an HBR patient. So they may be a very interesting subset to target with um, polymer-free uh, biofreedom. And thank you very much for being here and going through this interesting session with us.